Take a look at this bird. You may be saying, it's just a bird. It's just a bird. What are you doing showing us a bird? Actually, if you were in the downtown Corpus Christi area on Sunday, you might have seen this bird. Poking around in the garbage can in downtown Corpus Christi. You're all, you're, well, you're about to meet some people who saw that bird, and you'll meet some bird tourists, tourists who give us a give it who who give us an est, who will give us an estimate on how much bird watching costs well, along with bird sighting. What type of bird is it, and where did it come from? Here's Bill Churchill. A celebrity was spotted downtown, but these folks are a different kind of paparazzi. Yeah, it's just sitting there. Joan Holt drove over from Port A and was armed with binoculars and starstruck over this feathered friend. Well, this bird has never been seen in the U.S. before, and here he is in downtown Corpus Christi. That's right. All the commotion is over a bird, but not just any bird. It's called a cattle tyrant. First spotted downtown on Sunday. All the people came from the valley yesterday and there were like hundreds of people. The bird native to South America somehow making its way to South Texas. Rare for these parts. Liam Wolf rushing to Corpus Christi to get the shot. Well, yesterday I was in West Texas. I was in Alpine. I had just proposed to my girlfriend. And now that the word is out, you can expect many more bird enthusiasts are on the way. The closest sightings of this bird are in Panama, so this is a really, really lost bird. And so there's a lot of people who are in the United States that this is their best opportunity to see this bird. It's easier for them to come travel to Corpus Christi, Texas, than to take a flight to, let's say, Argentina or Brazil to see the bird. Bird watching tourism in Texas is said to bring in big bucks. According to Visit Corpus Christi, there are more than 200 species of birds in the area. Ecotourism in Texas was an $11.6 million industry. Bird watching was $4.6 million of that. Well, there we got somebody coming over. Bird watchers Sandy Dillard and Joel Simon say they're seeing more rare birds in South Texas this season. The reason? Well, they're not sure. But one thing is for certain. If it stays around, you could easily get... 10,000 or more people coming just to see this bird from all over the United States. These bird watchers drown to get a chance to check another species off their list in an otherwise unlikely place. Bill Churchwell, 3 News. Wow. All right, Bill. Thank you so So what an amazing bird it is to watch. Is it still in the downtown area? This is a switchbike. This. Is it still in the downtown area? We're not sure. But if it makes it to the Fly Bluff area, I'm pretty sure you, you people here in Fly Bluff will get a bird signing that bird wherever it is, and you too could be that bird paparazzi one day. So if you see that bird anywhere in the bluff, let me know, and I'll go check it out for myself. And, and birds might not fly in the rain. After, after the rain we've had for the past few days, we are still in the stage one to water restrictions in spite of those recent rainfalls that we had. Let's take a look. The day rain event that we have been seeing the city of Corpus Christi reminds us that the multi-day rain event that we have been seeing the city of Corpus Christi reminding you that we are still in stage one drought restrictions. That means people may only be able to water their lawn on their respective trash pickup days. So you should say, despite all the rain that we've been seeing here, not as much has been falling that is needed in our water sources. If there's common sense, it would tell you one thing. It would tell you to save up that water. Save up that water. Save that water for your lawn. Follow those stage restrictions. Don't ever break those stage restrictions. If you do, you, can, you probably could be in trouble. I'm not sure, but... Try to understand what the outcome and the and the uh, repercussions would happen if it did. So, and despite all the recent rainfall, there could there could have been some flooding going on. We wouldn't know what type of flooding would it be. All right. 
If you have copper, try to be try to be on the lookout for <coughs> copper. Especially in the Red's Pass area. The police chief in Pomeranza says it's problematic as it is. Thieves are also impacting public safety. We'll tell you more about that later. We'll tell you more about that a bit about that a bit later. Okay. Or in just a minute. But first, there is some great news happening for all you Corpus Christi Hooks fans. Ah! If you're interested in uh, designing your own t-shirt or or wearing a contest for your shirt, the Corpus Christi Hooks are doing that for you this month, this year. Let's take a look. And the Corpus Christi Hooks announced today the launch of their Design a Jersey Kids Contest. Kids ages 13 and under can enter to have a chance for their design to be worn as an on-field jersey or featured as a kids giveaway item in 2024. To enter the contest, you're going to download the template from cphooks.com or pick it up from Waterburger Field. That entry can be submitted in person there at Waterburger Field via email or uploaded to their site. The contest is open until 4 p.m. on December 22nd, and two winners will be announced. You have some time to start thinking of that design and to submit it, but man, that is so cool. How great would that be? Remember, though, simpler is better. Don't get too too uh, fancy with that. Right. <laughs> that is really good advice. Simpler is better. Yeah. Here you go. More than good advice, it's good common sense. Okay, we are we are just we're we're not going to we're just uh I don't know how to say this, but let's just move on from the jersey designs, the water restrictions, and the birds. Coming up next, we're gonna take you to Florida where overcrowded jails are happening. Tom Joe will explain these overcrowded prisons as time flies. Stay with us. If you were to talk to elected officials or elected governors or presidents, they would tell you this. <clears throat> we need to get drugs off our streets. And to do that, we need to overcrowd our prisons and not make them less crowded. We've got to lock up more people and we've got to toughen up as best as we can. What if your plan didn't work? What if your plan were to be to, to let all prisoners out early? It's exactly what happened back in Florida. If you were in Florida years ago and you were being released early, you might recognize this story that I'm about to show you. It's a story about how time flies to where you can get released early for your sentence. Why is it to where we overcrowd prisons when there's not enough room for the prisons in Florida? Here's Tom Gerald. These men are convicted criminals arriving at the North Florida Reception Center for processing into the state's prison system. Today's new arrivals join an overcrowded system that's under court order not to get any larger. Ironically, as there are more criminals convicted in the court with tougher penalties, especially for drug crimes here, an equal number of convicted criminals must be set free to make room for the new arrivals. Francisco Chambers got here this morning to serve a two-and-a-half-year sentence for crack cocaine. Have you been in before? Yes, sir. On what charge? Possession. Same charge? Same How many times? Mm, just twice. Good morning. What you got look like today? Florida's 37 prisons are full. Doyle Kemp's job is to make sure the corrections department doesn't violate the cap by even one inmate. A federal court order has given Florida just such a mandate. Changes in the sentencing laws last year now allow judges to give more prison time to more non-violent criminals. It created such a juggling act for critical bed space that Florida says it has no choice but to release prisoners early. The highest we've ever received is about 1,054. Mm -hmm. 
one 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 week period. We average a little bit over nine hundred on a weekly basis at this point. You heard right. Nine hundred convicted felons a week are cycled out of Florida's prisons thanks to the conflict between the surge of jail sentences and the lack of jail space. This has led the state prison authorities to come up with an ingenious system of putting men out as fast as the courts can put them in. Say your sentence is one year. Ten days off your sentence is automatically dropped for each month served. That's standard in most states. Then good behavior can reduce your sentence by another 20 days per month. But Florida's provisional credits subtract up to 80 more days off your sentence for each month served. That means every inmate gets four months off for every one month served. Florida's Attorney General, Bob Butterworth. We don't worry about escapes anymore in the Florida prison system. We've legalized escape. Because now, an inmate is not in there long enough in order to figure out how to escape before we open the door and let them out. Their progress is carefully tracked, not just by the guards in the towers, but by a central computerized system that keeps up with Florida's more than 38,000 inmates. The daily headcount must be accurate because with one mistake, and the state of Florida becomes the lawbreaker. Trying to keep track of 4,000 new inmates a month is a paperwork nightmare. There's stacks upon stacks and rows upon rows of files, overflowing with detailed information about inmates' history. In order to empty enough beds, many inmates, including violent offenders, are eligible for early release. Only a few are disqualified. People who are ineligible for provisional credit are sex offenders, firearm mandatory, drug mandatory, habitual offenders, and 25-year mandatory. Uh, but when you see a murderer come up, they can get out? Currently, under the law as it stands now, if you had a sentence for murder, you could receive provisional credits and be released. That's exactly what happened last November in Miami when an inmate with a violent history both in and out of prison killed two police officers just 10 days after his early release. Jail for attempted murder, Charlie Street had served eight years of a 15-year sentence, more than most. Then he got 610 days off simply for prison crowding and was let go. Tensions were high two weeks later when officials hauled him back in again for murder. <laughs> Richard Duggar is Florida's Secretary of Corrections. It's shocking to some people that inmates convicted of murder to a lesser degree can work their way through the system. I, I'm very sympathetic. I understand. Uh, I, I, I occupied the position of warden at Florida State Prison and, and, and during that period of time conducted 16 executions. So I'm no slinking violence when it comes to getting tough on crime. We're just faced with a dilemma. The Secretary says his department is not to blame. With strict new laws against drug offenders, there are just too many non-violent drug users occupying precious prison space. Something like 60% of uh, all the uh, offenders coming into prison now are coming in for drug offenses. And there, there, there are not enough beds there for them, so we simply have to adjust. And this is our way of doing that. Uh, I can cite one instance, I, I, I hate to do it, but uh, I can, where um, an inmate was brought into our reception center. We computed the, the amount of gain time that he would get and had to send him back to the county jail on the bus that he came on. He got, out got, time. There. he got out before he got it. That's right. At Calhoun Correctional Institute, Michael Denmark is typical of those inmates rushing through the system. As a first-timer, Michael did what's becoming increasingly frequent in Florida. He chose jail time over probation, hoping it'd be over quicker. My firm was for two and a half years. I was sent for possession of methamphetamine. How much drug were you uh, caught with? Less than a quarter of a gram. For less than a quarter of a gram, you were sentenced to how long? Two and a half years. But Michael level with me, among the men back in the dorms, out there, some, maybe quite a few, consider this program a joke. Sure. As far as hard prison time. Sure. Some of the guys, all they know is dealing drugs or uh, robbery. And they talk about that's what they're going to do when they leave. They're going to go right back to doing what they were doing. They just feel they were unlucky and got caught this time. Meet inmate Scott McGee. In 84, he was given four years for cocaine trafficking and served one year. In fact, he's gone to prison for cocaine three times in the last five years, with additional time for escape. Each time he was released early. And how old are you? Um, I'll be 27 in November. 
And what has uh, been your record as far as the law is concerned? Not too good. <laughs> um, mainly just um, got in trouble, screwed around with drugs a few times. What were you sentenced for specifically and how long? This time. This time. This time I was for buying um, uh, cocaine. I was receiving uh, two and a half years. Scott says there is some concern in the trade, as he calls it, that sentences are starting to get tougher. But with fortunes to be made in drugs, even that's not a deterrent. Now, some people who will say, uh, look, Scott is the type of guy that shouldn't be earning credits. He shouldn't be turned back because he has, he has a record of arrest. Uh, have you received any punishment by being here when you're going to be released so early? Uh, sir, the question is rehabilitation, how much time to serve, the quality of time. We're not we'll see how Scott is doing later. Ed Austin is the state attorney in Jacksonville. Uh, we maintain public order with a, with a credible threat of punishment. Uh, we don't have a credible threat of punishment. We're blocking. Austin says the new early prison release program has had a devastating effect on Duval County's crime rate. The state prosecutor's staff tracked over 1,100 people they sent to prison in the first six months of 1988 to see what happened to them. On November the 30th, 725 of those people were out on the streets of Jacksonville. By early January, 350 of them had been rearrested, most of them for very serious crimes. We were running the same people through the system. They were getting in the backs of police cars uh, with smokes on the face with the police officers. Because they don't think anything's going to happen to them. And the sad part of it is, in most instances, very little is going to happen to them. The criminal justice system, for most of the defendants who charge with crime, crime is a joke. It's like charging the enemy with a rubber knife. He's not afraid of you. Judge Hudson Olaf's been on the bench in Jacksonville's Duval County for almost 20 years. He's fed up with the monthly reports he gets from the state prison authorities on the early discharge of inmates he's sentenced. This list covered just one month. These are the people I tried. These are the people who pled guilty. These are the people who should be serving their time, but they're being released uh, early. And as you can see, there are hundreds of them. Do you ever see him again? Every day. The simple answer is to build more prisons. But Florida has learned it's a lot easier said than done. The problem is, who's going to pay? In Florida, prison labor is cheap. You're looking at a prison ironically called Liberty. It's one of six new dormitory-style facilities being built with inmate labor. Spirals and spirals of razor-sharp wire are used by these inmates to wall themselves in while they earn an additional 10 days off a month for working in the Florida sun. For years, as Florida toughened up its drug laws, it failed to build prison beds. And now playing catch-up, more beds are being built this year than in the past 10 years combined. But with close to 40,000 people in prison statewide now, and over 150,000 expected in five years, without more state revenue, there's no way to pay for it. The cost of building those beds would run something like $2.2, $2.3 billion. And the cost of operating those beds would run nearly six million dollars a day so that should be a, a, an answer to solve to everyone we cannot build our way out of it remember francisco chambers he's still in jail for now michael denmark returned home after serving seven months a fifth of his sentence and scott mcgee on this foggy morning in late september his fiance picked him up a very happy man Scott's sentence of two and a half years meant he could have been in prison until September of 1991. Instead, he served six months. He got the basic ten months off the top, three months off for good behavior, and eleven months off because they needed the space. It seems like Florida has cracked down on crime, but doesn't want to pay for the punishment. Are there any reforms in the work there? Yes, Hugh, there's a major reform underway now, which will take place shortly after the first of the year. Under that, convicted murderers, for example, will no longer qualify for this easy, quick time. They'll have to serve more of their prison sentence. If Florida's been at the front of this drug problem for, for quite a while, is, is that a harbinger? Are we going to see the same kind of difficulty in other places? We certainly are. People are in the mood to crack down to send drug dealers to prison. But when
without prisons, the rest of the country is going to be in the same dilemma that Florida finds itself in very soon. Yeah, we're going to see. We're going to work for you better. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Wow. I'm going to give you my common sense, Mike, but common sense about this when we return. Stay with us. All right. Common sense alert. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we finished watching a 2020 story about overcrowded prisons. Before we get to the common sense thing, yes, a couple days ago I asked the uh, original person who uploaded this video, I can use it for the show. He said he never heard of it until I sent him a playlist link. So I'm gonna give. So I want to give thanks to. I want to give thanks to. As close to crime, for allowing me to use this. For allowing me to use it, so again, I want to thank uh, as close to as close to crime for for letting me use it. So, here's the common sense perspective about this: we don't need prison loopholes. There's if there's one thing we need, probation and parole. That's all we need. We don't need early release programs. We don't need this prison loopholes. All we need to do: send them to jail, and then. And then they put it put it from there. We don't need any more of this crap. We don't need more of this crap to where we to where we um what was it what I'm looking for? We overcrowd. We don't need any more overcrowding. If we if we get overcrowd, okay. We gotta build more prisons, okay. It's us taxpayers. If this kind of crap was happening over in Texas. Then I will just raise hell the te next Supreme Court here to say, hey, we don't need this. We in Florida are in we in Florida we're in Texas. We are in tech we are in I mean it's just like Inmates being released early for having considerable time shaved off their sentences. I mean, we don't need any more time off because of the beds. I mean, if you get off for good behavior, you get off for good behavior. But for drug, but we don't need drug, we don't need druggies getting released or murderers getting released. They have to serve their full sentence. And it's what kind, I mean, I don't want to see people be released from jail a month from now, 30 days from now, because they just, Smoked some dope, or they assaulted somebody, or murdered someone. We don't need that. If people look at this and go, "We need this kind of program," I would say no. We have a bunch of prisons in Texas, a bunch of prisons here in Texas, and we need to build more. We, if we gotta build more here in Corpus, then we gotta build more from our tax dollars. Our tax dollars will be will be used to be to build more prisons. And if that were to happen, then. Zippity doo da, zippity a. It can be perfect. But we will never know. And if we didn't know, we would never be here, would we? No, we would not. We wouldn't even be talking about this, and we would not. And we would not even know what the hell went on. What the hell went on? Well, next, sexual misconduct in the country's largest air traffic control center. Now you're about to meet some people who say they have been targets. Did the government plan to, to promote this kind of crap? Bob Brown has this story. Stay with us. Last season, we discussed sexual harassment in the workplace. And, and from years ago, and from over the years, they gave me a break, we focused on sexual harassment in the workplace and in our schools. But this is something we've not been focused in on for throughout the seven years of this broadcast. Sexual harassment in the air traffic control center. Think about this. Just imagine as a military woman, 
You were forced to walk in a line in front of drunk men. Sounds kind of harsh. But did it, did it plan backfire to, to crack down on this? You are about to meet some people who say they have been victims of this sort of behavior. Did it, did it backfire? Well, you'll know until you see this report. Here's Bob Brown. This is the busiest air traffic control center in the U.S., the Chicago Center. In the late 80s and early 90s, it became one of the focal points of a new training program by the FAA. The program had nothing to do with handling air traffic. It had everything to do with addressing complaints from women and minorities throughout the agency. They said their lives were often made miserable as they tried to break into an area of employment that was traditionally dominated by white males. In 1988, a congressional subcommittee investigated those charges, and one of the women who testified was O'Hare controller Olivette Smith. So I'm sitting there working very heavy traffic, and all of a sudden I feel a hand, not on my thigh, right in my crotch. Uh, in an instant, I had to make an instant decision. Should I address this male and try to fight him off, or should I continue to work airplanes? I chose to work the airplanes. This particular trainer, he started yelling obscenities, critiquing me using four-letter words. Bitch, uh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, you know, you, you women, you, you don't belong here. And I said something to the supervisor, and the comment that I got back was, he didn't mean any harm. In a strongly worded report, the Congressional Subcommittee recommended that the FAA take action to change that work environment. So the agency hired experts to create three-day sensitivity training workshops. Some women told the experts they couldn't avoid occasional episodes of harassment even when they walked down this aisle on the way to their jobs. Diana Mocha compared the aisle to a gauntlet. I walk through a gauntlet every day, and that's down the road. Comments are made, sometimes it's just looks, but it's a very intimidating situation. One day a woman had on a short skirt, she's very attractive, and these two guys that I work with saw her coming and purposely stretched their cords opposite directions across the two aisles so that when this woman approached, she would have to step over the two cords to pass through our area. And I thought, uh, that's no big deal, they're just being funny. It was because men like Tom Reisel sometimes didn't think twice about things like that that one element of the new FAA workshops involved positioning women along two rows of chairs and having the men walk between them one by one. The idea was to have the men experience what it was like to hear suggestive remarks or receive unwelcome touches. But in a $300,000 lawsuit filed last week, one man claims that exercise and role reversal went much too far. The plaintiff is air traffic controller Douglas Hartman. In a damage suit he filed against the transportation department, he claimed that during one such session in 1992, he was groped around his genitals, called a wimp, humiliated by a chart on which women used drawings of penises to rape the men. He says he had tried to opt out of going through the gauntlet. So I announced to them that I wouldn't take part, and I assumed my wishes would be honored, so I let them last. I walked in the door, and the door was shut behind me, and uh, I was engulfed. There was really no way to move in or out. They uh, grabbed your legs. They um, grabbed you both in the front and in the rear, below the waist. It was basically a no holds barred type situation. Uh, One of Hartman's friends, Ken Kluge, says he went through the same session on the same day and witnessed the incident Hartman complained about. I saw him basically uh, put through the gauntlet against his will. Same touching, same grabbing, same verbal harassment. Well, that was one side of the story. There is another. When Doug Hartman came in and said that he walked in there and he was trapped and he was surrounded and groped and everything else, that did not happen. That did not happen. Richard Spates is one of several other men present at that session who claimed Douglas Hartman never passed through a gauntlet. He immediately said, I don't want to participate, did not even get near the women. And he walked to the left and went over and took a seat. Basically blew the exercises off. And from the start of the class, he tried not to participate in anything. What's going on? Well, many people believe the complaints were part of a preconceived plan to stop not just the gauntlet, which was discontinued after Hartman filed a work complaint two years ago, 
but the FAA's support of the training workshops, which Hartman characterized as mainly psychological experiments. Many minority employees we spoke with disagreed. They say the overall training worked, that office conditions improved, and that many co-workers and supervisors became more understanding of their discomfort. For three days, they get just a smidgen of what it feels like, and yet we deal with it on a daily basis in the FAA and in the outside world, quiet as it's kept. You know, how can they possibly fix their lips to complain about dealing with a few minutes of, of discomfort or just hearing about my discomfort? But too many elements of the training bordered on the types of insensitivity it was supposed to prevent, even though the FAA's own employees were helping conduct the training. Was it really necessary to display charts using drawings of penises? There was nothing in this room that you couldn't find on the washroom, washroom wall in Chicago Center. Except this was a training session, this wasn't a toilet. What we're trying to simulate here is that that stuff is just as offensive. And what just about characterizing the Bible as sexist? That too was reportedly brought into some sessions and was deeply disturbing to people who heard religions from Catholicism to Islam described as sexist. Um, I think it was referred to in this particular session as just the Bible being sexist or many different religions um, being sexist and how they got played out in our society also. It's very easy to see how people would have been offended by that. Well, Mr. Brown, we're, we're very much aware that people will come in with these varying degrees of sensitivity to what happens. But the FAA in Washington has heard enough and told 2020 this week it has stopped all training sessions conducted by the company responsible for the workshops. We will not conduct any additional training courses providing by, provided by the company um, whom these allegations revolve around. They spent millions of dollars on this program. If anything comes out of this, I would like to see a more efficient use made of the taxpayers' money. If you're going to do it, don't try to divide people. Don't humiliate people. Don't use abuse to fix abuse. Well, how widespread was this in the FAA? Well, uh, this was uh, concentrated in the Chicago Center because they said they wanted to see what kind of uh, impact it would have if a number of people in one place went through it. However, it was a general FAA policy through, throughout the agency. And they say that roughly 20,000 people went through sensitivity training of one kind or another, 3,000 last year. And uh, they still stand behind the concept. They say it was under constant review. But it appears that in many instances it got out of hand and touched on people's most sensitive beliefs and sensitive areas and, and when they were trying to do the office. However, it was, it was set up to correct a very real wrong. I think everybody agrees that there was a problem in the FAA uh, and on both sides. They say that they support the sensitivity training, but they support it if it's done right. Interesting. Thank you, Bob. We'll be right back. Everybody supports it if it's done right. So what's the common sense here? Do I even have to say it? I have done this show for seven years and over 400 episodes. 100 episodes. And I can tell you, by watching this, I've never even... this ever had the gut and courage to talk about sexual harassment in the, in the FAA. We've talked about the FAA before to where they allow people, they just allow like, they don't even check handbags. Excuse me. They don't even allow certain types of things to, to be touched. For crying out loud. We don't need any more of this. No more of this. So I'm glad that lawsuit was filed and something had to be done. If something wasn't done... In September, next sorry. to the opening of school... Sorry. Nothing else would have been done. We just wouldn't even be here. All right, here's what's coming up next. Here to these families, too. Thank you, Barbara. Next on the program, when you tune in TV talk shows, you hear the most scandalous stories, but are those talk show guests for real? Catherine Cryer with a surprising look at what goes on off camera when we come back. Stay with us. Dr. Phil McGraw, Maury Povich, Sally Jesse Raphael, 
Jane Jones, Geraldo Rivera, Oprah Winfrey, Phil Donahue. Are they familiar to you? TV talk shows. You may have your favorite like Jerry Springer, Steve Wilkos, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the scandalous stories you may have seen years ago on those TV talk shows. Like, I'm not actually a male, I'm a female, I'm not actually a man, I'm a horse. But are these for real? You decide. Here's Catherine Cryer. Guilty! The world of TV talk shows. It goes from the serious to the absurd. It gets strange and stranger. Now here's a twist. Half of the clips we've just shown you involve stories that were made up. They're fiction. We'll tell you which ones in a little while, but just how much of what we see on these shows is for real? How important is the truth in these stories? It's secondary. It's secondary to the show. Joy Romer was a producer for several talk shows until the insatiable appetite for sensational fare began to get to her. I was told, Joy, you're not being commercial enough. You're not being exploitive enough. You're not giving us what we want. Finally, she quit in frustration. Because she says the talk show version of reality too often doesn't reflect the truth. Uh, it's so cheap. We open the wallet. The president start rubbing their eyes. So they have a few daylight. Like For instance, the Montel Williams show. The subject, cheapskates and big spenders. Here are a boyfriend and girlfriend. Who bought all the gifts for my family and signed your name on it? Who bought gifts for your family and signed both of our names on it? Me. Did I see a dime? No. Okay? Not a penny. Uh, that's what you're supposed to do, though. You're my girlfriend. That's our job. Oh, right? Arna Itez and Tommy Carroll say they went on the show with their friends just for laughs. But it was all made up. Tommy and Arda never even dated. Tommy's pal Robert Chinesky went on as a big spender, pretending this woman, whom he now says he met two weeks before the show, was his longtime girlfriend. Martel, I enjoy spending money on a woman, okay? And she's a beautiful woman, and I spent money on her. It's just that it got to the point where it was, I was losing too much money. Simple as that. You know, does she want me or does she want the Franklin Mint? My name is not Franklin, okay? Right. It's Vinny. It's Vinny. <laughs> to top it off, Chinesky used the fake name Vinny Puma. Then there's this couple, Jennifer and Uriel Soto. They went on three different talk shows with three different stories in a matter of weeks. Some of what they said was true. On Jerry Springer, he's a man who says his wife dresses too sexy. If there is any outfit that I have on that is low cut, that is too tight, he will look at me and he'll tell me to take it off. And if I refuse, he'll simply rip it off. On Jenny Jones, the jealous husband. You you actually got into a fight with what, five guys? Well, what, what did they do? Together. What did they do? Um, said hi. <laughs> All tidbits of truth, but exaggerated, Jennifer says, to play better for the cameras. But the Sotos also out and out lied on Ricky Lake, saying they were married cousins. Okay, well, how did you two meet? Jennifer, how did you two meet? We met at a family picnic about three, four years ago. And nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. And when you showed up at the program, might you look at you and your husband and have any idea that the two of you would be related? No, he's a Mexican and he has black hair and dark eyes and I, I'm the opposite. Did they ever ask you any questions? Nothing. Nothing. There are a lot of people who will do anything to get on television. They'll even play the role of an imposter. Howard Rosenberg is a Pulitzer Prize winning television critic for the Los Angeles Times. You know, they'll play Joe, the, uh, uh, the incest survivor, on one show and come on another show and play somebody who's addicted to buying or spending, or going to shopping malls. What's the difference as long as you get on television? I think we've reached the point now where most of these shows will literally do anything to uh, grab and hold and titillate an audience. The long-standing success of shows like Oprah and Donahue has spawned a new generation of talk shows, all struggling for viewers in a highly competitive marketplace. Many of these newer programs, according to producers we spoke with, fly by the seat of their pants, showing little regard for the truth. Maybe it's a function of budgets, with the more established shows having the tools to avoid the pitfalls. 
But would some talk shows knowingly put fakes on the air? Or do they just put them on with no questions asked? We don't know just how many talk shows involve phony guests, but with little effort, 2020 found plenty of examples, including this one. Talk about titillating. It was the story of a gay love triangle told on the Ricky Lake show. This trio says they made up the scenario. They were all just friends, not lovers. And they say the producers never bothered to check out the story. They should have asked me point blank, are you telling the truth? They didn't. But never they're like, Ooh, you know, this is too interesting, this is right. juicy, this is a right. I mean, she was just so excited the fact that it was a gay story. It was just, <clears throat> that's all it took. There's so much pressure to get a guest that fits the slot that you need filled, that if you just find somebody who will do it, great. Now, you'll check as much as you can with the time that you have, but a lot of times you don't have enough time. And yet you're putting these people on the air and telling the American public, this is real. Right. No, it's very troubling. Doug Tilton and Mitch Ryan say Ricky Lake's producer loved their story, but wanted more okay. and told them to ham it up. She's like, you know, play with the audience, but don't, you know, don't do too much, and, and don't forget to bring in scandal, and we want to make it look like that Mitch is jealous. And so during the show, they say their friend Chris Thames made it sound as if he was having an affair with Mitch. Have you told this guy to, like, lay off? No. Well, no, I mean, I have more of a friendship, but it goes more than that when you're not around. Wait. <laughs> See, that's the insinuation that she wanted. The producer gave him that line. In a letter to 2020, a spokesperson for the Ricky Lake show says the staff makes every attempt to verify all of the available facts. But the letter continues. Because the shows often explore emotion, material becomes exceedingly difficult to verify when guests, their friends, and families conspire to lie. The show warns it will take legal action against anyone who uses our program to knowingly lie and misrepresent their story. While some guests lie to the shows, some show producers apparently have no qualms about lying to guests. And this cavalier attitude towards the truth can end up hurting people. They traumatized me in 20 minutes. You know, it took me 13 years to build my world up and they just destroyed it in 20 minutes. And no one said nothing. This woman's sister was about to appear on the Montel Williams show. Then she got an invitation to be a guest, too. Yvonne Porter says the show's producer wouldn't tell her the topic, only to expect a helpful surprise. I told her that I wasn't going to do the show unless I knew what it was. And she said it's about her old boyfriend. She figured there'd be a reunion with a boyfriend she hadn't seen in years. That is, until she heard this. We've been talking about people who feel the need to be provide mercy sex, if you will, to someone else. And I, I'll go back for just a second. Montel said, for those of you just joining us, we're talking about mercy sex. And I was like, mercy sex? And I'm looking like, what? What am I doing here? Who did I have mercy sex with? Then came the bombshell. I had sex with him to get him off of her back. Yvonne's sister said she'd been having sex with Yvonne's boyfriend. They lied. They outright lied. How could, I mean, I asked her, was I going to be embarrassed and humiliated? She said no. What did she call that? I mean, that was serious shock. About the biggest feather you could have in your cap as a host of a daytime television show is to have a guest that you can embarrass live on television. Really sad back this person. Uh, to the extent that he or she is unable to extricate uh, himself or herself from the situation and has to sit there and take it in front of the television camera. That's exactly what happened to Yvonne Porter. Yvonne Porter is suing Montel Williams, who turned down our request for an interview. In court papers, Williams denies wrongdoing. An arbitrator is reviewing the case. Montel may have set up Yvonne Porter, but did Jerome Stanfield set up Montel? He says he was down and out, suffering from HIV and psychiatric troubles, and he thought he could make some money. So he called 1-800-MONTEL-2 with a story idea. 
Stanfield says he told the show's producers he had a drug problem and had obsessive fantasies about rape. But that's not exactly what ended up on the air. In the process, I raped over 90, 90 prostitutes at gunpoint, at knife point. And, um... You did this over a three-year period of time? Yeah. About three years? Yes. Yeah, it was scary, powerful, exclusive. An admitted serial rapist on the loose, telling his story for the first time in front of a national audience. Stanfield says he changed his story after talking to the show's producers. So that's the direction that it took me in to say that the rape fantasies was, in fact, not fantasy, but actual rapes and a prostitutes. After the show was taped, but before it was broadcast, Jerome Stanfield was detained by the police and interrogated. He told them he'd made up the story because he thought he'd get money. The police released him, saying there was no evidence he was a serial rapist. Did Montel Williams know you weren't telling the truth? Yeah. Was there any question in your mind that that they knew this story was a fabrication? They knew it was a fabrication from the start. You know, with Stanfield's track record, we can't be sure he's telling us the truth. But what is clear is that Montel Williams had his doubts about Stanfield's story before broadcasting the show. So what does he do? He runs a little advisor at the beginning of the show saying some questions, quote, unquote, have been raised by this man's credibility, raised by the man himself. But we have no information at this time that leads us to believe that he is not telling the truth. And because of that, we feel it is our duty and our responsibility to broadcast this program out of concern for public safety. How can with any good faith, uh, in any sincerity, continue to do a show like this knowing there's a very strong possibility that the entire show is BS? In a letter to 2020, Mary Duffy, the executive producer of the Montel Williams show, says the program refutes the claims made by Jerome Stanfield and others cited by 2020. Ms. Duffy also acknowledges that with at least 700 shows to date, it is feasible that a few guests could lie for celebrity gain. The producer says the show stands by its booking and producing ethics and will pursue appropriate legal action against those who lie. So how are viewers to know what's real and what's made up? They can't. So what's to be done? I think it's incumbent on uh, the rest of the media, those of us who consider ourselves to be responsible, to just alert uh, viewers and the consumer public as much as possible to what these shows are doing. And that's all you can do. And then if they continue to want to watch these shows, that's America. Right? Guilty! Catherine, there's so many of this type of show that I can understand how under pressure of competition there would be a great temptation not to delve too deeply into, into facts on this. Well, you talk to the producers and they say, we try the best we can, but many of the shows say we consider ourselves entertainment and it comes with the territory. Yeah, and then mistakes can happen. They happen to everybody, I guess. I, a couple of years ago, I remember, you remember the character Buckwheat yep. in the, uh, yep. our gang comedies? We thought we had found a guy who said he was Buckwheat, and unfortunately, Buckwheat had died a while before that. I, I wasn't aware of it. Nobody in the studio caught it, and so the next week, I apologized to his family because it was kind of embarrassing that that was a mistake. But, but look what you did. You came on the air and made a public apology so that everyone knew what the circumstance was, and unfortunately, we don't see that on these shows. And that, that's a little different from deliberate sloppiness under under pressure. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. If you and I haven't made a mistake in the last minute, we won't have to be apologizing a week from now for what we just said. Wow. Just wow. You can't really tell what you see on talk shows, but you can't expect the truth. One instance was to where I mean if you watch Dr. Phil, you may have realized that he that the way he tell the way that he tells that your lines if your lips are moving. And Speaking of which, we all know Dr. Phil's going to prime time, and we would do, we would look at some episodes to where they've been telling the truth about someone's from this and this. I mean, if you watch Maury Povich, you'll realize that that man is cheating on the woman, and the light hair has determined all this. So if you watch Maury Povich on the DNA test and the light hair test, you know the truth is getting out. So when you watch, so I would advise, I mean, Steve Wilkos was a police officer, and I don't recommend, here's his doctor's argument. Jerry Springer got canceled because, because he was doing Judge Jerry. 
Mora got canceled after 30 years. So, what shows do I recommend you watch? The talk shows I recommend you watch. Steve Wilkos and Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil is now on OWN from your local TV station. And Steve Wilkos, as for Steve Wilkos, you can check your local listings for Steve Wilkos. Or set your DVR to record Steve Wilkos. That way you'll know what he's talking about. Because he used to work for Jerry Springer Show. And... He was a police officer. So he had, now he has his own talk show. And if you watch his episodes, free on nosy, you'll know that he gets the truth. And what does common sense say? Find the truth, but don't believe the lies. We'll be right back. <laughs> you ever wonder when you talk back to your parents, you'll get the ultimate punishment? It was to, It's probably to where you talk back to your parents, you would probably get a smack. But what if you realize that your friend was right there on headset telling you what to do? It's not his power break, it's all about Ben. Now he plays the Asian dad. Just watch this. I told you to do- Hey son, I thought I told you to do the ditches! One second boys. I will dad, after this game. I yeah, uh, you always play the game! I've got some free time, so I thought I'd hop in the game with the boys. Free time?! What about your homework? I've already finished it all. Okay, then why don't you act for more study to do? Dad, I'm only grade 6 and you've told me up to grade 12 maths already. I'm just trying to catch a break. Okay, but look at your cousin. He Bro, you shouldn't let your dad talk to you like that. It's literal abuse. No way. Yeah, it's true. So if you don't get out of the game right now, I'm going to... Where's my belt? I'm wearing track suit. I'm going to smack you! Especially if they're threatening to hurt you like that. You can call protective services and they will arrest him and take you to another family. So you really want to smack, huh? I'll do it! I'll do it! Dad, you can't. You're not allowed to. Why not, huh? You my son! Why not? Why I can't? Now tell him this, because it's against the law. And what you going to do about it? You going to call the police? You're doing great right now, just to finish it off, copy me. You know, I come here on the boat, I'm working 15 years to buy a house, Dad. bring this family up, give you food, now, I'm gonna and call you... them, and then protective services will come and take me away and arrest you. Okay. What did I say? I did this to my parents once, and they've left me alone since. Yeah, damn! This whole time! Now, to finish it off, assert your dominance, scream out, You, Dad. Wait, what? Think about all the abuse he has put on you. Think about all the times he said no when you wanted that toy. Think about all the times when you wanted to eat something, and he said no. Channel all that anger and throw it back at him, and you'll feel so much better after. <laughs> you, Dad. Yo! Feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> Wait. I hear my dad coming. Son? So, are you here to apologize, Dad? Bro, he bought a whole ass chair. He really wants to talk this out. Yo, that's hype! Fuck you, Tom! No, you choose to go! Oh, 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 hey, sorry! I'm gonna help you! Okay. Oh, 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 no! Oh, oh, please! How about you one step ahead? Oh, vacuuming done. Whew, mopping done. Windows are clean. Alright, dishes done. Let's go. Yo, what's up boys? Just finished all my chores. Hey boy! Max, I got a lid. Hey! Come here, come here. Yeah, this. This grand of rice should get his attention. What the? Dad, what are you doing? Why do you not respond to me, huh? Oh, what was that? I have headphones on, Dad. I couldn't hear you. Anytime I'm talking to you, you need to respond, okay? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. What What do you want? Stop playing the game! Go do your chores! I already completed everything. Did you vacuum? Yeah, I already did. Okay, then go mop. I already mopped as well. Oh, okay, then go, go clean the shower! That's done. Go I've on. already cleaned my room, cleaned all the windows around the house, pulled the weeds out of the garden, I did the laundry, I also cooked dinner for tonight, I painted the garage, and I also washed the dishes. You liar! You're not cleaning the dishes! W what? What are you talking about? I did. Oh, okay, if you clean the dishes, have a look at this one! Okay. If you clean it properly, what big one? <laughs> what? That? It's literally just a spoon. Are you talking back to me? You said to respond to everything you say, so do I talk or do I not talk? May I? Homework? Just clean it, okay? Okay, I'm sorry, I'll clean it. Done. You happy now? Do you have anything else for me? What? Yeah, one more thing. Right. What in 
in the anime are you doing? Pray you survived it? Oh, shit. <laughs> That's kind of funny to watch. So, common sense would say never talk back to your mama or your daddy. If you talk back to people like that, you're going to get yourself in a whole lot of trouble right hey, now. Hey, son, I thought I told you to do the ditches. One second, boys. I will, Dad, after this game. I, yeah, you always play the game. I've got some free time, so I thought I'd hop. So, really, common sense would say never talk back to your parents. That's key. All right, coming up tomorrow, criminals out on parole. Well, not, well, scratch that. Coming tomorrow, we got the parole thing coming up in, in next next week's show. Come, coming up tomorrow, the use of a hidden camera. Why experts say prime time gone too far. You'll hear from the jury from the food line story. Now, you'll also, sorry, coming up on, come up on tomorrow, the food line story, the use of a hidden camera, and its bad intentions for use. You will also hear from the jurors from the food line story, and you'll also hear from food line themselves. What went on? The use of a hidden camera. And also coming up next week, next Wednesday, our very special gimme break, Safety in America. We're gonna tell you how you can be safe in America, how to defend yourself by using tasers. Pepper spray, mace, just basically how to defend yourself. And the biggest one ever, never talk to strangers. That's all come up. That story's come up in a few weeks, and I hope that you'll join me. That's all of us this Game Break Tuesday. We'll see you again tomorrow for Game Break Wednesday. And I should point out, we're not doing Mondays anymore, so Game Break's going to be, we're going to do our shows Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. If we got to do makeup days, we'll do Sunday and Monday. So again, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Throwback Thursday's open going on. So we'll see you tomorrow for Game Break Wednesday. For all of us here at YouTube, good night.